so we could get Good morning, America. How are ya? We'll be 500 miles before the day is gone. They called me the city of New Orleans. Hi, I'm Denny Yelsma, and I'm at the world famous Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum in beautiful Jacksonville, Florida. And today is Monday, and you know what we always do on Monday. You guessed it, we do show and tell. And show and tell starts right now. Show and tell starts right now. Today we have a very exciting show. What I want to talk to you today about is our scratch built cars that we have running here at the museum. I want to start out that this is a museum, a living museum that where we run trains. And our whole goal at the Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum is to preserve the history of railroading within a 50 mile radius of Jacksonville, Florida. And so in the model railroad uh, community, there are certain cars that are just not available to be exact to the history of that particular car. And so uh, we have had a lot of scratch built cars made just made from scratch and uh, I'm going to have uh, Rodney Butcher, our president of the club, explain a little bit more about that. But what we're going to show you today is the cars that were scratch built and the reason we had to have these scratch built because it depicted certain trains that came into Jacksonville. And so when you see uh, some of our segments is called running trains one, two, and three, and uh, you see all these trains running. They are exact for that particular date, and it was uh, we feel to preserve the history of the railroading in North Florida that we wanted to be exact, so that history could keep uh, living, and we're reliving. Uh, right now we're running in the 1949s and early 50s. And so that we are running living history trains. And so I'm going to uh, start out right now. I'm going to introduce uh, our president, Rodney Butcher. Rodney, uh, real quickly, Rodney spent 44 years as an engineer with the Florida East Coast. He's been ret retired now two or three years. And this museum that you see here is his love and passion to preserve the history of North Florida and the railroading in it. So Rodney, welcome to our show and tell. Thank you, Denny. And uh, uh, I don't know about you, but I just love doing show and tell. I like watching the guys talk about their projects. And as you know, uh, the vision of this show and tell uh, goes back to my childhood when I would go into grade school and over the summer and we had to tell uh, what, what we did and then if we got something new and I remember bringing my Lionel uh, F7 to the uh, teacher at show and tell and she was so impressed that I would get up in front of people and talk about uh, anything. And so here I am uh, 70 years later still doing the same thing. So we're going to start out uh, Rodney, tell me about this first car. This here is a Florida East Coast, and it's called St. John's. You know, I, I look on the internet, or I see other clubs, and I see uh, cars that says Florida East Coast, Atlantic, Seaboard. So what's different about this particular car? It's got Florida East Coast, it's got a car name. Explain to us what... Well, thank you, Denny. First, I'd like to recognize Mike Stamey who is Southeast Scale Models. He is a charter member with us and he has made available to us things that nobody else has. And he has scratch built cars that are rare cars or limited cars or one of a kind cars. And his artistic abilities, he either builds from blueprints or in later years the railroads modified cars and home shops and he has the ability to scale down and make the cars 
as close to resembling what we saw as possible. Now, in reference to the St. John's River, was a bud product ordered by the Florida East Coast. It's a one-of-a-kind car. It was ordered before the World War II and was delayed and delivered in 47. This car was the only car that was a baggage express coach. It was later converted to a full baggage dorm without the coach. The coach was eliminated. This was a one-of-a-kind car and primarily we think it was intended for some type of a daylight train between Jacksonville and Miami. Nobody really understands why Florida East Coast ordered that one, one particular car. But anyway, there's our representative. This particular model shows the dorm in it. Uh, originally, it had all coach seats. Well, uh, I'm glad you uh, explained the, the details. And I want to add something uh, to about Mikey. We call him Mikey, but his name is Mike Stamey. A lot of he's been making models for 30 years. But uh, I joined here five, six years ago, and I thought I was a decent modeler. Well, after meeting uh, Mike Stamey, I felt like I was in kindergarten. And one thing that uh, I credit any improvement on modeling 100%, well, maybe 80% uh, to Mike Stavey and 20% to, uh, to you, or maybe I should split it half and half, but, but uh, you guys have made me a scale modeler. Now, I have not reached the quality that Mikey or you do, but uh, uh, I just wanted to throw that in that, that uh, when you have good quality modelers, uh, it brings the uh, best out of everybody in the club. And I can work on a model and uh, I bring it here and Mikey will say, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, we need to do this and this and this. And boy, that has really helped me uh, as a modeler. Let's go to the next car. And it is also a Florida East Coast. And it is Jamaica. So tell us the, a little bit about Jamaica. Jamaica is another unique car. It was one of the newest cars. It was built in 54 and was assigned to the new Dixieland, which was in hopes of saving a Chicago, Florida train that operated over the L&N, NC, and St. L, and the various railroads that that uh, brought the train down. They all had uh, joint cars, their own cars to fill the train out. This particular model is a 4514, which meant it had four roomettes, five bedrooms, one compartment, and four sections. Which, what happened in later years, Pullman sections were not as popular. So, in order to accommodate people's choice or selection of type of room, the railroads built these extremely rare cars to give them a choice in their accommodations without adding extra cars to the train. So the new Dixieland had less Pullman cars, but they allowed passengers to have different configurations of their choice. Okay. Okay, Rodney, our next car, this is so uh, exciting to me to talk about these cars, is the Florida East Coast, we've got another Florida East Coast, Pan, uh, uh, Panama. Panama, and uh, can you explain to the viewers uh, the connection of Florida East Coast with uh, the different railroads in Jacksonville? Or, and then the car, naturally. Sure. Well, Florida East Coast named their sleeping cars after South American countries. Um, and this particular car, the, the Panama, was built by Pullman Standard in 49. And the coastline, Florida East Coast, and some other railroads joint ventured into these cars, the RF&P. 
these cars were not popular. They were not liked because the people that traveled on our trains down here wanted bigger accommodations and 21 roomettes were just not comfortable. They were too small for families. So these cars were regulated basically to trains that had a lot of military movements. So military people that were moving between bases online primarily got the accommodations in these cars. Okay. Okay, Rodney, our next car is Salvador, and it is a Florida East Coast uh, also. Now this ran all the way up to New York City, correct? Yes, they they alternated in the Chicago service and in the uh, New York, Florida trains. It again is another car. It's a two bedroom, 14 room up, which made a more affordable uh, accommodations, but they too were not real popular because again, they had a lot of uh, roomettes and little minimal bedroom service. But they did serve a purpose and they gave people a choice versus the 21 that was just solely for roomettes. Our next car is a very exciting car and I like it and uh, uh, Rodney I want you to inform me again and the viewers this is another Florida East Coast car and I know when I started modeling some uh, FEC uh, I just fell in love with the Azalea and so but it is an observation car called the Azalea so Rodney tell us about this car the Azalea was purchased with a joint effort with the Southern Railroad for the new Royal Palm. The car arrived in 1950 from Pullman Standard. And in the off season, when the new Royal Palm was a winter train, when it wasn't in regular new Royal Palm service, it was on the summer Royal Palm. The Azalea was really a fa uh, fantastic car. The big windows inside had a raised platform floor where you had extremely good view. So much so that the railroad in 60 converted it to their business car. And that was the Florida East Coast. That was the Florida East Coast. Uh, they, uh, now I, I see on this in here, this has a uh, silver roof and that's how it ran with the uh, New World Palm, correct? Yes, yes. Now, if a modeler wanted this, there is nothing on the market that's even close to this, is there? No, a lot of people mistakenly use things like the 20th Century Limited cars or stuff like that, but it's nowhere near the same car. And uh, I've heard some people say that, well, I'm going to take a, a 20th Century Hick, uh, Hickory Creek and uh, the uh, inside, they just turn it around. That wouldn't do it, would it? No, because the window configuration matches the compartments. And if you'll notice, there's three windows on this side. <clears throat> and if you were in the car, you open the door, and the door looks out the window. So the aisleway did not have a lot of windows. They were just strictly. So if you were in the room, you could open your door and see out the other side. Well, that's a, an advantage. And now. Uh, when did the uh, Florida East Coast make this their office car and what did they do to it? They, they made it an office car in 1960. The Southern pulled the car off uh, the Royal, the, the new Royal Palm ended I believe it was in 55 and the observation cars were taken out of Royal Palm service and Crescent service which Southern had the same car, along with A&WP, New York Central. But these these cars were uh, assigned to all the premier trains. This this car on the Florida East Coast, like I said, it went in office car business in 60. And they did limited modifications until the mid 70s. In the mid 70s, they revamped the car and then in later years, they 
in my estimation, they destroyed it. They modified it beyond recognition on the inside. Uh, but on the inside, I know as a member of the Florida East Coast Railroad Society, uh, we made arrangements with the FEC, and I know you remember this, but uh, we got to ride from Bowden all the way down to uh, Sunbeam Road, and uh, or actually uh, to Bayard. And uh, to me, uh, that was a great thrill of a, of a ride. And uh, I know uh, you could see the interiors was, was not like a, what it was during the, the heyday. Now, as an engineer, do you have any real quick stories that come to your mind about the azalea that you, uh, when they put it behind one of your trains? Well, the funny thing is, when I talk about they destroyed the interior in the 90s, or I guess it was in the 90s, they gutted the car, they took all the weight out of the back end of it, and made it essentially a modern modern car so so much so when they got done with it the, the back end of the car did not weigh enough and the first time they ran the car and set the brake on the train it slid the wheels flat on the rear truck because there wasn't enough weight so they had to put a restrictor on air pressure to equalize the car rather than put any kind of weight back in it. But Pullman Standard had actually used rail in the back end of that car under the raised platform to weight the car down. And they took all of that out, did not put it back, and it, it cost them a lot of money to replace the wheels that they flattened. Well, and this is still uh listed as an office car for the FEC, I believe now, they're not running it like they used to. Uh, so uh, we kind of wonder where uh, the Azalea is going to end up. And, uh, the Azalea is one of my favorite cars, and uh, we, I just love to see it run here at the, the museum. Uh, well, I'd like to add her sister cars, the canal on the L&N, and I can't remember the River Street, River Street, or Canal. anyway, those two cars are still in private car service with private owners, and they've been refurbished and they're beautiful. And there's an A and W P one somewhere. It it was on display in Panama Park or Panama City at the music at the college. And last time I saw it, it was in uh, of all places Plymouth on the Central Florida Central. So, where it is now, I don't know. Well, I know Mikey uh, made uh, just the other day uh, the uh, Royal Canal, which we're going to be running here at the club on the uh, golf win when uh, the uh, time wise uh, is ready to run that car. And he did a beautiful job on the, uh, they had uh, the Royal uh, Street and the Royal Canal that they put on. The uh, golf, golf, win. golf win. Yeah, they, those cars were removed out of Crescent service, and L and N put them on the uh, Golf Win because this allowed for a small train to still have first class amenities. A lounge was just a rare thing to have on a short train. So by putting a car like that on the train, it really gave. As, as we've done segments on the Gulf Wind, it really made for a nice train. Yes, and you know, uh, I'd uh, always say it was kind of like a secondary train, but by adding the uh, observation, made it, a, like you said, a first-class train. And from New Orleans to Jacksonville, which was about, about uh, 500 or 600 miles. It, for those of you that are young, Amtrak can't hold a candle to what amenities the train had. You actually got up and went somewhere in the train itself. You didn't just sit on a seat and were stuck there. You could go to a lounge car, a tavern car, the dining car, sometimes a dome car, but you had various accommodations and amenities to enjoy on a train. Some of the trains had dining car, lounge combinations. I mean, there was numerous things that the railroads did to accommodate passengers 
where now Amtrak has taken the men's lounge and the ladies lounge out of a long distance coach and made them a water closet. People have no idea what train travel was like compared to now. You may as well just ride a bus. So, well, I agree with you on that. And you and I, Rodney, uh, were aging ourselves, but uh, we were so lucky to ride some of these trains. And even though when we rode them, it was kind of getting to the end, but there was still uh, many, uh, most of the Florida trains, they kept right up uh, to top notch. So, we have some cars to refer to coming up in one second. Okay, Rodney, what we have here is a, a car that uh, Rod, uh, that uh, Mikey embarrassed me. I handed him a brass car and I said, hey, uh, Mikey, can you letter this? And he says, uh, what numbers you want? I said, well, I want Atlantic Coastline. And he says, it's not Atlantic Coastline train. It's a Pensy. And I said, well, it looks like it. He said, well, we don't do that here. And, uh, and, and uh, that's where was my first education with Mikey uh, explaining the, the detail of this car. But this is an observation. So Rodney, tell us about car number 257. All right. This car was a second order that was received after the war in 47. The blunt end observation car was a unique car because the railroads were able to put a tavern lounge mid-train without interrupting through service. So we have a blunt end where the, the car could have been an observation car, but primarily they were used in trains that were split. And again, this is one of those cars that had the amenities that I'm referring to that that uh, you had a the, the section had a bar where you get light food and beverage service. Then you had small dining tables for snacks and sitting. And the back end of the car had very comfortable rounded seats, much like one would have in their living room. So this car was not a high revenue car. I mean, the only they didn't sell seats. The only thing they sold was beverages and, and snacks. So the railroads gave passengers comfort over profit. Now I know the blunt end cars, on an observation car you could have the, you know, the old heavyweights was open platform and then but the lightweights, uh, they called blunt ends and I know uh, the Rock Island, the Southern Pacific, the Pensy had, had some and the Burlington had uh, one they used on their Denver Zephyr and the uh, Atlantic Coast. Now this particular car, correct me, but it was really uh, signed from Miami to uh, New York, is that correct? Yes, these cars primarily ran on the East Coast and the West Coast champions. Florida East Coast had them and Atlantic Coastline had them, also Seaboard had them, but Seaboard had more of the teardrop observation cars that they ran on the rear end of their trains, which they continued up till Amtrak. Now, a modeler cannot buy this car, is that correct? Not that I'm aware of. They've they, made various blunt end cars, but not this accommodation. Uh, they've made them for C&O and other railroads, but not the Southern railroads, the South railroads. And also, the Southern also had one on the Tennessean. That's right. And the reason for that, they added heavyweights on the rear end of the Tennessean. So it made for a tavern car, a mid-train tavern car, but you could still use it as an observation. And I'd like to also add, then he was talking about heavyweight observation cars with the open platform. In later years, the open platforms were dirty. It was a neat idea to go outside, but if you ever did it for any length of time, Lord Almighty, you'd have to get washed to come inside because the mist coming out from underneath the train, whether it's dining cars, sinks, or even bathrooms, the mist at a high rate of speed, you would get filthy. 
Makes sense. So the Pullman company took a lot of those cars and closed them in, and they made one of the attempts, they made uh, solarium cars with larger windows in the back, but for the simplicity and cost effectiveness, most of them were just, the platforms were closed in and they put windows in the end of the car. So you'll see a lot of trains listed in those days with 10 section lounge. The old days they said 10 section lounge observation car, but Pullman Company modified cars to accommodate after the war. Okay, our next car that we have, it looks like it's a, a sleeping car, but it's a Atlantic Coast Line Virginia Beach. And boy, I, uh, I just look at the detail. Uh, you know, it's got the uh, Venetian blinds and, and uh, just unbelievable uh, the detail that uh, Mike puts into these cars. So we're, and I see it has some purple on it, and this one doesn't have purple. So tell us, well, just tell us about Virginia Beach. Okay, well, first off, I'll touch on the color. The Atlantic Coastline, their cars primarily had purple letter boards and originally silver trucks and silver roof. Later on, they painted the trucks black and the roof black. Um, depending on if the car had a steel roof or not, it was delivered black. This car was delivered black from ACF. And Is it, that, can I uh, sure. uh, inject something? I was always, uh, during the war, the uh, War Department made the roofs all that had to be black. And there was a regulation that uh, I was informed on. Is this a leftover from that or? I've, I've never heard that because Southern or Seaboard never painted their roofs black. Okay. But this particular car is another one of those special cars. This car was delivered from ACF for Atlantic Coastline, Florida East Coast, and I believe RF&P. This was a sleeper lounge car. The lounge section was for first class only. Coach patrons could not enter this car. And again, we're looking at the aisle side. The bedrooms are on the other side of the car. And you'll see the handrail in the window, and there's a door going to each one of the bedrooms. Well, that's detail. But that's Mike. There was a, a uh, little wet bar here. You had your own car attendant serve light beverage and, and snacks. Now, the lounge section here was only for the people in this particular car, is that correct? In all, in all the Pullman. The Pullman passengers had their own first class lounge. The other tavern lounges that were in the train were open for everybody. Okay. And a lot of times the meals were served in this car if the diner was full, the first class patrons could get service in their lounge or possibly even in their bedroom. Well, that's, uh, and that just showed the importance of the uh, uh, Pullman uh, car attendant. They were, and to be a Pullman car attendant was, uh, you had to really have a lot of people skills <coughs> and you had to, uh, really be friendly and they made a lot of uh, money on tips a little side note that you may find funny those of you that hate to make a bed you'll never find a bed that was tighter than a Pullman car those guys knew how to make a bed and I to this day I don't know how they made them so tight I agree well let's go to the next car I know I like this car uh, the Augusta, tell us about uh, the, now it has a sister car too, but tell us about the uh, uh, Augusta. The Augusta is a car that was remanufactured in Rocky Mount on the Atlantic coastline. These cars were, again, a combination of lounges and some of them had tables for dining and they had various accommodations to suit 
the needs of a smaller connecting train, which kept a, a, a secondary train first class with the amenities, light food service and and the comfort of being able to have somewhere to get up and go out of your coach seat. Now, where did this car run? Those cars, this particular paint scheme was used in the 50s and it ran on trains like the Vacationer, uh, but primarily these cars were regulated to uh, Florence, to uh, Augusta, and the Jacksonville St. Petersburg trains and in other other branch line trains that way when when the major the main body of the train continued on and you went out on a branch line you still had all the first class amenities you know I often say uh, that uh, the uh, airlines in the uh, 40s and the 50s copied the railroads for their service and today you know you get on a airplane and most of them have done away with business class and first class it's just uh, coach cars. The railroads and just listening to you they really put the emphasis on that customer and they wanted uh, uh, to give them good service so when they had to go from point A to B uh, they really made it uh, very uh, pleasant way to travel and you and I have talked many times what a shame I wish we could have that type of service back now let's switch a little bit away from the pasture to a revenue making uh, uh, made a lot of money for the railroad and that was the railroad post office or we call it the RPO so tell us about this particular uh, RPO and uh... well let me touch back compared to the the Augusta notice it's got a round roof the railroads added air conditioning to these old heavyweight cars and they put undercarriage to our, our skirts on them to blend them in better with more uh, modern equipment so these always are commonly referred to as turtle back roof. So in order to blend in, Seaboard put a turtle back roof on an RPO. Of course, they didn't air condition it, but they, they streamlined the car in appearance so that it would blend in. This car was one of the last heavyweight cars to be rebuilt. You'll see it's got aluminum sash windows. The uh, Seaboard, Florida East Coast, and None of the railroads down here, only the Southern Railroad ever had a streamlined RPO car because the railroads saw after the war with the advent of the airlines, they knew their days of mail service was limited. So they did not invest in RPO cars. So they modernized the ones that they had and they, blend, they tried to blend them in as best they could. Now, the Seaboard took some of these cars and painted them gray to blend in with a streamlined train. Atlantic Coast Line painted some of them purple to blend in with their uh, purple streamlined trains. So attempts were made to, to disguise them as newer cars, but essentially they did the best they could without overspending for a service that they knew was limited. Well, Rodney, I enjoyed the conversation today. Every time I talk to Rodney, I learn something, and it's just such a joy, and that's why I just uh, absolutely enthused about being a member at the world-famous Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum. We have listeners all over the world, and we get a lot of comments. And what we talked about today is there's the reason why we're so world-famous when it comes to the accuracy of uh, the trains that we ran, and you, as you could just see, and it's just an absolute joy. And that's the way it is at the world famous Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum in beautiful Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs>